My, my, my first draft, David can testify to, is actually a deconstruction of that, uh, of that um, uh, uh, TED talk um, in which I, I really felt like he gets right up to the edge of saying something really daring. And then he slips off into how much money the arts generate and how important it is for our humanity. But that whole thing about that hybrid artist deal is really dangerous and, and really something that, that threatens a lot of professional, professional artists. Um, that was my first draft. And David uh, emailed me and said, uh, where are you? Are you going to say anything about yourself? Or are you just going to talk about Ben? And I was like, all right, all right, all right. So many, many drafts later, um, the reason that I have these notes here is that I totally rewrote my presentation on the airplane yesterday between Atlanta and Bloomington Normal because I realized that I had spent the entire first half of the presentation haranguing everybody about the dismal state of the arts world. Uh, you know, I had facts from Actors Equity that the median income for actors last year was zero <laughs> because 59% of Actors Equity actors didn't work at all last year. I had facts from TCG, and I had the outrageous fortune stuff that was already been quoted. I did what Ben Cameron did that first half, and then he had to kind of apologize. I'm glad you, you invited me. And I told my wife what I was going to be talking about, and she was like, are you nuts? It's not even lunch yet. You can't lay that on <laughs> first. <laughs> so I rewrote the whole thing. Um, you all know, most of you who are here, I suspect, Almost all of you who are here are somehow artists or connected to artists. And you deal with all this dysfunction all the time. You don't need somebody to tell you that. You know how it works. So I'm going to skip past that. Um, I also kind of feel really connected to this personally because of what David said. As soon as I'm finished, um, I'm going to hop back in the car and go down to Illinois State University in Normal, where my stepson is graduating from Illinois State as an actor with his girlfriend who's an actor and tomorrow they're going to pack up the car and they're going to move up here to Chicago and join you all trying to figure out a way to make the arts work for them. And so I have a, a personal connection to finding a way to strengthen the arts scene. Um, I also am personally connected because I'm a theater professor. And uh, I teach at the University of North Carolina in Asheville. It's a small liberal arts school, about 3,500 people. Uh, very small department. And there was a point where we had a, a, a very popular um, professor who was going to be leaving, going off to get married. And so we decided to um, uh, have a party for her. And we wanted to contact all of the alums. And so we asked the alumni department to give us a, a listing of the addresses of our alums. And when I looked at it, I discovered that there was no, none of our students who were living in New York, none of our students who were living in Chicago, none of them were in Los Angeles. There was a couple in, in uh, Atlanta. There was a couple in Charlotte. There was a whole bunch of them who still hung out in Asheville. And then a lot of them went home or somewhere close to their family. And at that moment, I sort of said, what am I doing? Am I really giving these students the skills and knowledge and understanding that they need for what's going to be their life path? Is a, a class in, say, auditioning relevant mm -hmm. if you are going to Murphy, North Carolina, where there is nothing to audition for unless you create it? That those thoughts sort of coincided with a sabbatical, one of those nice things that we professors get. And I went off. And some of you know that I, for almost six years now, have written a blog called Theater Ideas. And, and I use theater ideas to sort of float my ideas and, and then be sort of electronically beaten up for a while to see how those ideas could be made better. Um, and in fact, some of the bloggers here in Chicago are the, my favorite pugilists. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I had been reading uh, 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 an interview with um, Ben, uh, Bill O'Brien, who at that, that time was the head of the um, theater program for the NEA. And he said something that pissed me off. And so 
I did what I always do. I wrote a blog post about it and said really bad things about him. And then I posted it. And I thought, which was uncommon for me, I really should give him an opportunity to respond to this if he wants to. So I emailed him. I said, here's what I said. Here's the link. I, I will pro put whatever it is you want to put up there um, you know, without editing so that you have a response. And he, surprisingly, he emailed back. And he had a nice response, and I posted it. And in that email, he said, I've been reading theater ideas for a couple years now, and I'm really interested in your ideas. Maybe we could talk um, about how that connects to the <coughs> NEA. And so my first tip is, if you're looking for funding, abuse the funders. Uh, start that blog and rip them publicly, and then you know they might contact you. And so in our conversations, he got me to uh, submit the first grant I'd ever written in my entire life to the NEA. And lo and behold, nine months later, it was funded. Um, and it was funded um, for me to do the research to create what became the Center for Rural Arts Development and Leadership Education, Cradle. Um, that's the alternative to uh, a, like a, a business incubator. I kind of feel like incubators is where you put sick babies. Cradles is where you put well babies. And so that's what I wanted to do. It was a cradle. Um, and part of cradle, the LE part, the leadership education part, is to create um, education that will take some of these students of mine who, when they came to this party for this retiring faculty member, were embarrassed and apologizing because I'm not using my education, my, my major, I'm not making my living in the, in the theater. I didn't really think that that was particularly relevant. Um, they were involved, they were acting, they were directing, they were designing costumes, they were doing all kinds of things around their, around their community, but they weren't professional. And so there was guilt involved. And I wanted to figure out a way that maybe we could eliminate some of that guilt. So my plan at that, po at that point was to write this book about the regional theater. And that got thrown out the window, thanks to Bill O'Brien. Um, and, and the result was, was Cradle. And I want to share a few ideas that kind of come out of my research. But first, a disclaimer. One of the things that I get hammered about a lot on the blog is that I seem to be dissing people in New York, Los Angeles, or Chicago, who I call Nailachi, because uh, I got <laughs> tired of t typing not New York, Los Angeles, and, and Chicago. <laughs> And that I'm saying somehow that no one should go there. And that's not true. In fact, I have a, a student who just graduated. His name's Casey Morris. When we were talking about um, what he should do when he graduates, I said, you need to go to New York or Los Angeles, Chicago, because I think you've got something that, that they're going to be interested in. So I, I think that that's you know, the path. It's a path for a lot of people. But it's not a path for everyone. There are a lot of people who really would like to go home. There are a lot of people who would like to have a family. There are a lot of people who really don't like big towns. And they need to have a path as well. Um, so in order to do this, I need to look for those people who have not been, uh, I don't want to call it corrupted, but sort of inundated with this, uh, the, the American Idol approach. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, th there are two messages to the American Idol. One is the traditional Cinderella myth, right? Where, where you, you're, you're humble and you're working and then someone comes along and suddenly you are chosen and you become the princess, all right? And that's part of the American dream and it always has been part of the American dream. That's not the part that bothers me. The part that bothers me are those little sections where some hapless singer does a really poor performance, and Simon Cowell, is that his name, just rips him a new one. And we all sort of watch it and kind of laugh, maybe uncomfortably, I don't know. But what's the message there? The message is, if you are not super talented and beautiful, shut up. Go home and buy the CDs of the people who are super talented and beautiful. And I think that that's sad. I think that everything that we're hearing today and everything that's been written by Clay Shirky and even alluded to by Ben, uh, ben Cameron is about participation. And part of that means embracing non-professionals, people who are not making their living but perhaps making their life doing art. Art isn't a commodity, or at least it's not primarily a com commodity, uh, but we treat it that way. 
Um, right now, most people buy their music. They buy their films. They buy their theater. They buy their dance. And they experience that creative act vicariously. I think that we need to get people to go back to singing their own songs, telling their own stories, dancing their own dances, painting their own pictures. Partially because it's important to us as professionals, because statistics show that people who participate in the arts are much more likely to participate by buying a ticket to a professional <laughs> artist. That's important. But not only because of that, that's like the people, when I was growing up, the, the people who uh, were putting video uh, equipment in the, in the classrooms, uh, if they could sell ads you know, in it, uh, and they would provide programming. You know, having that kind of, oh, we, we can eventually get them to give us money, is, you know, f should be at least secondary, if not further down. We need a creative, abundant community, all of our communities. And not just big communities, <coughs> right? Urban, the arts have become very urban. Uh, if you look at um, the, the enrollment, the theater uh, members of the theater communication group, what you find out is that 60%, I, I thought it would be higher, but even that is pretty high. 60% of the theaters that are member theaters of TCG are in counties of over a half a million people. Only 4% of the counties in the United States are over a half a million people. So 4% of the counties have 60% of the arts. Meanwhile, all of these small places have very, very little, and very, very little attention, and very, very little funding, and very, very little of anything. And then we wonder why it is, when it comes time to vote for NEA funding, it's so easy for legislators to hammer and vote against it. Why shouldn't they? None of that money's coming into their community. None of their uh, constituents <laughs> are doing the arts. So why would they not vote against it? It seems like something that is for somebody else. Not only should the people <coughs> in these places be doing the arts, but they should, in my opinion, be creating art that is by, about, and for that area. All right? And my analogy is restaurants. You can go anywhere in the world and you will encounter certain restaurant chains that have a certain you know, decent quality of food. You know what it's going to taste like. It's pre presented in a certain atmosphere that you recognize, and it's fine, and it's good to have those things. But when you visit somewhere, what you want is the local cuisine. When I go to uh, you know, New Orleans, I'm not going to go to you know, TGIF. I'm going to go to somewhere and get jambalaya. If you come to Asheville, North Carolina, you want that Eastern uh, barbecue. right? You want the things that taste like that place. And the arts should also be like that. You should be able to go and, and find arts that taste like the place that they're in. Conventional wisdom is arts organizations can exist in small places. Um, not true. Um, I have, uh, just in Wisconsin, I found some amazing places. There's one called Stage North in Washburn, Wisconsin, population 2,280. It's got this beautiful, brand new building that overlooks Lake Superior. It's got a bar in it. It's got a 150-seat theater in it. They've got, they do a play every month. They've got um, music constantly going through their, their own film festival. They've got a film series. They've got, it's the place to hang out. Last year, they sold 10,000 tickets in a community of 2,000. To me, that makes them the center of the American theater. If you do that math, five tickets per capita in New York City, you have a lot of theater tickets. All right. Um, but what they're doing, there's another one in, in Amory, Wisconsin, 2875, been going for 25 years. What they do is they combine the arts. They bring it all together, and it's participatory. So this is what it is that we're talking about in almost everything we're talking about here. Let the people participate. So what's the role, then, of the professional artists? Are we just out the window? No. It was just spoken about here. You mentor people. 
And so when we start to, and you help them, and you create your own art, and you become what they aspire to become, and you teach people, and you share what it is that you're going to do. And so that should be part of the educational experience, not just how to do it, but how to get other people to do it. Um, I think that that would strengthen the voting patterns and everything else. I think that the NEA would, would, would perk up. I think the NEA should sponsor these things. In fact, I think that the NEA should stop giving so much money to these 50, 60 year old institutions and start doing venture capital. Yeah. All right? Yes. Absolutely. You know, yeah, you know, I'm all, Illinois State's where I, I went to school, Steppenwolf, all that Steppenwolf stuff. But doggone it, they've been around for how many decades now? It's like some 60 year old living in their parents' basement still. <laughs> Get them out! It's time for them. <laughs> <laughs> Figure it out, you know, come on. So, so let's shift some money around and provide venture capital, but the venture capital is, is only given to people who can create a business plan that actually will work and be sustainable in five years. So for those first five years, you sponsor people so that they can devote 100% of their time to their art, and after that, man, you are on your own. Don't come to me again. There's a, there's a, um, a really beautiful song that Harry Chapin sang. I don't know if any of you are Harry Chapin fans. He, he wrote a song called Mr. Tanner. And Mr. Tanner is this incredibly sad story about this man in a small town who sings beautifully. And he's got a um, dry cleaning business. And um, all of his friends are like, man, you sing so good, you sing so good, you need to go to New York. And so he goes to New York, he rents a hall, and he has his New York debut, and of course, critically, he is slammed. And he comes limping home, and he never sings again. The chorus of that is, music was his life, it was not his livelihood. And it made him feel so happy, and it made him feel so good. He sang from his heart, and he sang from his soul. He did not know how well he sang, it just made him whole. I would encourage us to take that vision and spread it to every corner of the United States, small and large, and invite people back into the room again <coughs> and let them become whole. Bring the arts back home. Thank you.